those with whom I've been traveling, welcome back. Welcome to everyone else. Welcome to uh, those in the in the last row. I just want to call out. We have some uh, members uh, from colleagues from our operations center uh, who are here to observe today's briefing. Obviously, our operations center uh, is really uh, a nerve center for the department. We were just saying that many of us literally could not do our jobs uh, without the operations center. So appreciate them being here, and um, even more so appreciate the work they do uh, every single day. I uh, have a couple things at the top, and then we'll get to your questions. First, uh, to meet the Secretary's goals to modernize American diplomacy, win the competition for talent, and ensure that all applicants can present a full picture of their qualifications, the Department of State today is announcing improvements to the Foreign Service selection process. The Department is moving away from the Foreign Service Officer test as a pass-fail gateway test and expanding focus on a candidate's education and experience for a more holistic approach in the selection process. Starting with the June uh, 2022 Foreign Service test takers, all candidates will proceed to the Quali uh, Qualification Evaluations Panel, or QEP, where their performance on the Foreign Service test will be one factor taken into consideration along with the personal narratives that they'll submit during the registration process. Combined with scores from the Foreign Service exam and the quali Qualification Evaluations Panel, which reviews each candidate's work history, education, experience, and six brief written narratives based on Foreign Service core precepts that will give the department a more val balanced view of candidates who will be selected for the next phase of the foreign of the selection process, the Foreign Service oral assessment. This change is happening in the midst of what is expected to be the best year for Foreign Service intake in a decade. I think many of you saw the news uh, earlier this month that we had uh, the largest class of incoming uh, officers, more than uh, just under 200 officers, uh, and we expect this year uh, to be the best year for our intake in a decade. Uh, it is the most significant change to the Foreign Service selection process since 1930, and we anticipate this change will result in identifying a more qualified pool of applicants. Next and finally, the United States is deeply concerned by the Tunisian president's decision to unilaterally restructure Tunisia's Independent High Authority for Elections, or ISIE. A genuinely independent election authority is critical given its constitutionally mandated role in Tunisia's upcoming referendum and parliamentary elections. The United States has consistently communicated to Tunisian leaders the importance of upholding the independence of key democratic institutions and ensuring Tunisia returns to democratic governance. We remain committed to supporting the Tunisian people and their democratic path and renew our call for an inclusive and transparent political and economic reform process with civil society, labor unions, and political parties represented at the table. Uh, with that, happy to take your questions, Matt. Thanks. Um, yeah, just first briefly on the FSO testing thing. Um, you're aware that this is not a universally claimed, correct? <coughs> that there's uh, particularly asset that raised here some what seem to be some pretty significant concerns about this having been done without any input from them, with that, or any other federal employee group, whether you want to call it a union or not. Um, Will their concerns at all, do they matter? We are in a regular discussion with outside groups, including, of course, in this case, AFSA. AFSA is an important organization. Uh, their input uh, is and will be especially valuable on these types of decisions. I am also aware, Matt, uh, that the previous or still the current process uh, also endured some criticism, uh, given a narrow focus on a pass-fail foreign service exam that didn't take into account uh, the applicant's uh, holistic qualifications, uh, what that person has done, that person's educational experience, uh, that person's uh, individual circumstances. Uh, we are confident that this restructured and revised process uh, will help us select an applicant pool uh, that is qualified, that is experienced, uh, and that brings to bear the talents and diversity that this country offers. Well, then why not eliminate the exam altogether? We still need various metrics uh, to measure uh, uh, potential uh, new colleagues uh, against. So the Foreign Service exam will continue to be one such metric, but uh, we're going to look at a more holistic so picture. Would you, you, would, you would equate this to colleges and universities no longer requiring SAT or ACT scores for uh, incoming students? Or how, how, you know, well, look, we are, we are gratified that we have, uh, and especially in, in recent months, uh, received a tremendous uh, amount of interest in this department. Uh, and with so many applicants, thousands upon thousands of applicants 
we need various metrics against with which to, to weigh applicants. So, so the the S, the SAT uh, uh, example is somewhat analogous. I'm not sure it's a perfect comparison, um, but well, just as the SAT is done, the test was administered by the same people as the SAT back in my day, at least. But if you're getting so many more applicants, wouldn't you think that it would be more important to have a pass fail on the on 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 the the, on the foreign service exam, we we rather think than letting everyone go into the everyone who takes the test, they all go. Doesn't that just bog the bog the whole selection process down? Uh, not at all. Um, we think it is important again to be able to measure uh, different uh, aspects of a candidate's qualifications. The foreign service exam will continue to be one input. All right. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, and I'll be brief so my colleagues can go. Uh, two things. One is uh, I realize that Secretary Austin spoke a, kind of about this earlier, but, but what, what you're seeing in, in Moldova and Transnistria right now, uh, does that give you any particular con particular concern? And then also um, yesterday it came to light that the Russians had launched attacks on several train stations uh, in, the, in the west of Ukraine. And I'm just wondering if there was... Uh, any indication that you guys had that this might have been related at all to uh, the two secretaries' train journey in the Kiev and out? When it comes to Transnistria, Matt, you are right. The Secretary of Defense uh, addressed elements of this this morning. Uh, but as I believe you've heard, we are aware of the explosions that occurred yesterday uh, in Transnistria. We're closely monitoring the situation uh, as we determine what happened. Uh, we reiterate the Moldovan government's call for calm in response to these incidents, and we fully support, as you have heard us uh, say before, uh, Moldova's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, we respect its constitutionally uh, guaranteed uh, neutrality. We don't know all of the details beyond uh, regarding what transpired yesterday, but we do remain concerned about any potential attempts uh, to escalate tensions. Uh, I would just reiterate that over the past uh, and recent weeks, certainly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, you have seen us uh, demonstrate the partnership we have with Moldova in a number of ways. Some of you uh, here in the room today were with us when we went to Chisinau uh, with Secretary Blinken uh, just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, we know that if left unchecked, Moscow's aggression against um, uh, Moscow's aggression could become uh, a threat to the region. Uh, that's why we're not leaving Moscow's aggression unchecked uh, in Ukraine. It's also why we are standing with uh, our partners in the region, including all our uh, Moldovan partners. Uh, since February 24th, since Russia's uh, renewed invasion of Ukraine started, we've committed more than $30 million in humanitarian assistance to support the humanitarian response in Moldova. As you know, Moldova is generously hosting uh, many Ukrainian uh, refugees who have been forced to flee their homes, uh, and $100 million in develop de development assistance to strengthen Moldova's long-term democratic and economic resiliencies. Our militaries uh, work closely together. They cooperate in places as far off as Kosovo. Uh, we were, as I mentioned just there, uh, a few weeks ago. And last week, we relaunched with Moldova our strategic dialogue, a dialogue that had been on pause uh, for several years. Uh, Moldova is a strong partner. We are working to make sure that they have what they need uh, to respond to the regional consequences uh, of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Yes, Andrea. Hi, Ned. Uh, I want to ask you about Lavrov's comments from last night uh, <coughs> to not to underestimate their threat. And I know that Secretary Austin responded very briefly at Rammstein to this, but uh, it's the first time we've heard this from the Russians in quite some time. Um, the last thing that we heard, you know, analytically was what Bill Burns said in Atlanta in his speech. Well, he's ready, but uh, in talking to Secretary Muniz today, he, he, he talked to me about the nuclear threat, which is, you know, he's so deeply invested in. He said to me that the Russians have now turned nuclear deterrence on its head using the nuclear threat against a conventional opponent that they have invaded, rather than as it had been used for decades, as which was short destruction against two nuclear powers. So I'm asking more broadly about how concerned you might be as Russia may feel increasingly cornered in this next phase, and as the weapons delivery is obviously so increased uh, from the West. 
to use check to come to the weapons. I also want to ask you a follow-up question about the rail. Sure. And let me start with that one first. So we have seen in recent weeks a pattern of bellicose statements. And whether you call them statements, whether you call them bluster, whether you call them propaganda, um, this has become a pattern. Uh, these certainly are pro provocative statements. Uh, we think they are deeply irresponsible. Uh, we deem them to be a continuation of the Russian government's very clear attempts to distract from its failure in Ukraine, to distract from the brutality uh, that it is perpetrating on the Ukrainian people, to distract from its apparent unwillingness to negotiate in good faith, uh, and to distract from its history uh, against its neighbors. Uh, they have at every turn sought to deflect responsibility for their actions by uh, attempting to shift blame from where it resides, and that of course is with the Kremlin, uh, to other parties, whether that is to Ukraine, whether that is to NATO, whether that's to the West, whether that is to uh, the United States. Uh, Director Burns referenced this, as you mentioned, in Atlanta. Uh, we've spoken to this before. We think loose talk of nuclear weapons, nuclear escalation, is especially irresponsible. It is the height of irresponsibility. Uh, and it's a clear contradiction of what the Russian Federation has confirmed and reconfirmed on any number of occasions, including uh, with the UN Security Council uh, statement that emanated earlier this year uh, that a nuclear war can uh, uh, must not be fought and can never be won. Uh, that is a statement we heard from Moscow during the Cold War. It's a statement we heard from Moscow after President Biden's uh, meeting with President Putin last June. It's a statement that Moscow signed on to earlier this year. Now, that is not to say uh, that even as uh, we talk about this in terms of bluster, in terms of propaganda, in terms of provocative statements or bellicose statements, uh, that we're not paying very close attention uh, and that we're not thinking through various contingencies. Uh, we absolutely are. When it comes to uh, potential nuclear escalation, uh, of course, we are uh, paying very close attention uh, to Russia's activities, uh, to what it's doing, to what it's not doing. Uh, you've heard from the Department of Defense uh, that we are always evaluating our own nuclear posture. Uh, and at this point, we have determined uh, that there is no reason uh, to change our posture. You said you had a follow up. Is there any, to any extent, do you think that Secretary Austin saying that our goal was to weaken Russia so that they can never again invade uh, when you were in Poland? Or Secretary Blinken saying that um, Ukraine is winning and that Ukraine will be a sovereign, independent nation. I'm paraphrasing long after Putin is gone. Do you, do you, was that in any way prov provocative or poking the bear or changing the mission to be not just helping Ukraine defend, but helping Ukraine win with the heavier weapons at, as well? You know, I noted today in the hearing that Senator Romney, while praising, fulsomely you know, praising, praising what has been done so far, said with the caveat of what Secretary Blinken had said, Secretary Austin had said. I have to say, I've been a little bit surprised by the surprise that I've heard expressed uh, regarding Secretary Austin's comments. Uh, this is a point that we have made for some time now. We have said for months uh, that we intend to make this invasion a strategic failure for Russia. Uh, they have endured tactical defeats on the battlefield. They have lost the battle for Kyiv. Uh, they have lost uh, a large number of Russian service members, Russian equipment. Uh, you look at Russians, Russia's economy, Russia's financial system. Uh, they are well on the path to strategic defeat. Uh, and one of our goals in seeking to ensure this outcome has been to ensure that something like this couldn't happen again. Uh, and that's precisely what Secretary Austin was referring to. It is precisely what Secretary Blinken was referring to some six weeks ago, the middle of last month, as I recall. He did a, an interview with NPR, and he made a couple of points then. Uh, he said, one of the things we're doing is denying Russia the technology it needs to modernize its country, to modernize key industries, aerospace, defense, high-tech, uh, energy exploration. All of these things are going to have profound effects 
not just the immediate effects we're seeing, but increasing and growing over time. He went on to make a second point. We'll want to make sure that they, Moscow, um, uh, that uh, to make sure that anything that is done in effect is irreversible and that this can't happen again, that Russia won't pick up and do exactly what it's doing in a year or two or three years. So this is a point that uh, we have consistently made, not only that uh, this will be a strategic defeat for Russia, a country that has on an unprovoked, unjustified, brutal basis invaded its neighbor uh, and that continues uh, to rain down uh, terror on its neighbor. Uh, but we've also made the point that um, we want Ukraine to win. And that is why uh, we have a strategy that has these two principal prongs. Uh, number one, uh, we are doing everything uh, we uh, responsibly can to help Ukraine defend uh, its sovereignty, its territorial uh, integrity. We have uh, uh, contributed billions of dollars uh, to this effort more than $3.8 billion worth of security assistance uh, since the invasion began, about $4.5 billion uh, since the start of uh, this administration. And as I alluded to before, the other prong is what we are doing to hold Moscow uh, to account. Uh, that includes the sanctions. It includes the export controls. Uh, it includes uh, the visa restrictions. It includes everything that you've heard from us uh, that uh, places accountability on the decision makers, uh, who are responsible for this invasion in the first instance, and all of those uh, in their inner circle and uh, the circle surrounding them, who in some ways have uh, supported uh, this disastrous decision. Uh, and that is something that uh, we will continue to do. Yes. Thank you. Can I just follow up on that before we change? Let me, let, me do, let me do one follow up and, and okay. Kylie, go ahead. Um, I have a follow up too. Please. Kylie, go ahead. Okay. I'm just curious. Um, you said that you know Russia is well on the path to strategic defeat. Can you expand on that idea a little bit for us? Because you talked about them militarily not doing well and hope that they won't be able to invade Ukraine or another country again. But what does strategic defeat mean for the Russian economy? for Russia's place in the world going forth and, and some bigger ideas beyond the military. Well, that's precisely what it refers to. Uh, you can talk about battlefield progress or, or lack thereof. Uh, and that, of course, is important when it comes to the fight for Ukraine's freedom, uh, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity. Uh, but when we talk about strategic defeat, we're talking about Moscow's positioning in the international system. and. The Moscow that uh, prepared to invade and that on Fe Fe February 24th went forward with its uh, invasion will not be the same Russian Federation in terms of its positioning on the world stage uh, that will emerge when this conflict is over. Uh, and we mean that in a couple different ways. Uh, one, you, all, you can already see uh, the uh, toll on Russia's economy and its financial system. It's an economy that is forecast uh, to contract by some 15% this year. It's an economy that is losing hundreds, some 600 uh, multinational companies that have made the choice uh, to leave the Russian marketplace, either not wanting to in any way support uh, President Putin's war machine uh, or making the very strategic decision uh, that it's not a market that will be worth the investment, uh, either now or uh, when this is over. Uh, you've seen what's happened to the Russian stock market, to Russia's currency, uh, but you've also seen the toll that, and you will see over time increasingly, uh, the toll that the export controls will have on Moscow's ability uh, to um, wield strategic influence on the world stage. And the way in which we are choking off key inputs uh, to Moscow's defense industry, its aerospace industry, its, techno its technology, uh, its energy and uh, um, oil and natural gas exploration capabilities. All of those things coupled with the pariah status uh, that President Putin has on the world stage and the diplomatic isolation uh, that Moscow has endured since, especially since the start of this invasion where it has, um, uh, where it has seen itself uh, handed really brutal defeats uh, at the UN uh, and be an object of scorn by the international community. All of those things add up uh, to 
the simple fact that because of uh, Moscow's unprovoked, unjustified uh, invasion against Ukraine, uh, not only will Ukraine emerge uh, sovereign and independent uh, when this is over, uh, but Moscow will emerge weaker. And we're already seeing that. Uh, and many of these are uh, tools that will have increasing effect over time. And just one quick follow up on that. Um, Moscow will emerge weaker for the long term or when this um, war comes to a conclusion, will they be given the opportunity to rebuild themselves? Will you guys keep the sanctions in place or will you take the sanctions off? So these are decisions that really are in Russia's hands. Uh, our sanctions, every sanction, uh, is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. And uh, the end in this case, the near-term end, is seeing an end to this bloodshed, uh, putting an end to this violence, bringing this war to a conclusion. Uh, so we've made the point that as long as Moscow escalates, we will escalate with our sanctions, with our economic measures. Uh, if Moscow uh, changes its course, uh, we will change our course. Now, that's not to say uh, that there won't have to be accountability. Of course, there will have to be accountability. And we've talked about various accountability uh, mechanisms. Uh, we also want to see to it again, uh, as the secretary said some six weeks ago and Secretary Austin uh, alluded to yesterday, that something like this, this type of aggression, uh, can't be repeated, whether that's in days, weeks, or months, or years. Uh, from the conclusion of, of, of these hostilities. So just, just to follow up on this very point that you just mentioned, you said for weeks, months, or years, and so on. So you're, this war can go on conceivably. I mean, to achieve the strategic defeat of Russia can go on for years. Is that no, that's not what I was referring to. What I was referring to is that we want to see to it that Moscow's aggression, aggression of this nature, can't be repeated once this conflict is over whether that is weeks after the conflict ends, months after the conflict ends, or years after the conflict yeah. ends. You know, you keep saying that they are losing on the battlefield, yet they are controlling, they have controlled Mariupol, they are controlling the, the east, they are controlling the north, and so on. It's not exactly like a defeat. And from the Russians, from their point of view, they say, we have good relations with China, we have good relations with India, and so on. Sure, you know, they are pariah in the West, but not among other countries. Relations with no other country, even particularly large countries, will be able to replace what Moscow has lost and will have lost uh, by its actions and the response that, together with dozens of countries across four continents, uh, we've put uh, in place. So no relationship, no set of relationships uh, will be able to compensate for uh, what Moscow uh, will have lost and, and stands to lose. Uh, to your first point, there's no denying, of course, that Moscow has a lot of firepower. Uh, they have demonstrated uh, not only the capability, but I think even more disturbingly, a willingness uh, to brutalize the Ukrainian people. Our goal is to see to it uh, that this conflict, this war, Russia's war against the people of Ukraine, uh, is brought to a close as soon as can be achieved, uh, precisely, uh, to put this violence to an end, to put the bloodshed to an end, to put the brutality uh, to an end uh, as well. You mentioned uh, diplomatic isolation. I get the sentiment, but the, as a matter of fact, the propaganda that we are talking about right now is being pushed during Russian leaders' meetings with world leaders. UN Secretary, you know, uh, Secretary General was in Moscow today, and Lavrov, some of the statements that came out of Russia today, in fact, came during those meetings. And uh, President uh, Putin made a statement during his phone call with Erdogan talking about, you know, already having Mariupol in his hands. My question is, do you think the world leaders' communications with Russian leaders should be you know, preconditioned with uh, getting out of Ukraine first before we communicate with Russia? We believe this war uh, has to be brought through to a close through dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, and we've consistently said that we support diplomatic efforts that are done in full coordination in the first instance with Ukraine. Uh, that's most important because these are not choices uh, that will be the purview of any other country, any other international organization. Uh, the Ukrainian government, an expression of the will of the Ukrainian people, ultimately is going to have to be the entity uh, that makes decisions uh, that affect its country going forward. Uh, so whether it's the efforts of the Turkish government, of the German government, of the Israeli government, of the French government, uh, of other governments who have uh, used their good offices or offered their auspices uh, for 
dialogue between the parties or attempted to shuttle uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we support those efforts as long as they're done in full coordination uh, with our Ukrainian partners. Yes. Thank you, Dad. Um, a couple of questions about the second year section. This is something that Secretary was asked in today's um, um, hearing at the Senate. Um, as the leaked phone calls suggested yesterday, sanctioned Russian oligarch, who is one of the major architects of uh, this war, Mr. Evtushenko, and Georgia's richest man, oligarch, even if really controls the Georgian politics from the shadow, they are figuring out the ways to bypass the sanctions and secure supply of vital grain products to Russia. Evtushenko himself confirmed the authenticity of this conversation in the interview with the Georgian media. Based on these leaked phone calls, David Orofamia, who is a leading Ukrainian politician who chairs the negotiations with Russia, had, he appealed to the Western leaders to consider imposing personal sanctions on Ivanishvili and his assets in the West. Does the U.S. track or assess um, this phone call, this leaked phone conversation? Do you have any assessment of that? And uh, what would be your response to that, you know, the, when it comes to, like, imposing secondary sanctions to those countries or institutions who are helping Russia or Belarus, you know, bypass these harsh uh, measures? So I'm not in a position to speak to any purportedly leaked phone call or to mm -hmm. confirm the authenticity or not uh, of what you're referring to, but a, a couple points. Uh, not only have we leveled uh, sanctions and other tools against those who are responsible for the Kremlin's decision uh, to go into Ukraine, those in Russia, those uh, in Ukraine, uh, but last week we announced a, a large tranche, tranche of sanctions uh, against those responsible for facilitating sanctions evasion. And so sanctions evasion is something that we are taking a very close look at uh, around the world, whether that's in Russia, whether that's in Belarus, uh, whether that is uh, anywhere else around the world. And I think our actions last week demonstrated that uh, we will go after uh, those networks, those entities, those individuals uh, who are uh, willfully, deliberately, uh, systematically uh, evading uh, or helping others to evade these sanctions. Of course, I'm not in a position to preview uh, sanctions on any individual or any specific entities, um, but it's something we're taking a very close look at. Yes, Jane. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nid. Uh, I have two questions on uh, South and North Korea. Can I ask about you, Ukraine? North North Korea. Korea. Uh, sure. Before we go on to uh, another region, uh, we'll take a couple of final yeah. Ukraine questions. We need to, Connor? Sure. Uh, Mr. Secretary Blinken announced, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on Monday, that the uh, State Department would return some diplomats to the community this week. Can you confirm whether or not that has started today and, and if they successfully made the journey back to Poland today? I can confirm that. Uh, the Deputy Chief of Mission and members of the embassy team uh, traveled to Lviv, Ukraine today, uh, where they were able to continue our close collaboration uh, with key Ukrainian partners. Uh, today, they met with interlocutors from the Ukrainian Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, as Secretary Blinken announced yesterday, our diplomats are uh, returning uh, and have returned to Ukraine this week on a temporary basis. Today's travel was a first step ahead of more regular travel in the immediate future. And as we've said, we're accelerating preparations uh, to resume Embassy Kyiv operations uh, just as soon as possible. Uh, we are constantly assessing and evaluating and reassessing the security situation with a view towards resuming those embassy operations uh, as soon as possible, again, to facilitate uh, our support to the government and people of Ukraine as they bravely uh, defend uh, their country. On, on yep. uh, Bridget Brink being finally nominated, what took so long? It's been you know over a year into this administration. You said you prioritized this relationship. Why did it take so long to get a, a nomination? Well, the fact is that we haven't had, unfortunately, an ambassador in Ukraine in several years now. And of course, need not go into uh, why we didn't have an ambassador there in the first place. Uh, but uh, there are processes um, both within our government uh, and coordination uh, with the host country government, in this case, our Ukrainian partners, uh, that are a prerequisite uh, before we're in a position to uh, announce a nominee publicly. Uh, in this case, we've been uh, gratified to hear uh, of the reception to her nomination. Of course, we've heard uh, a very positive response from our Ukrainian partners. Uh, and today, uh, for those of you who are watching Secretary Blinken on the Hill, uh, you heard again a very positive and welcome reception uh, to the news from members of Congress, uh, who we hope will be in a position to take up her nomination uh, very shortly. Now, just to check on the Lviv thing, that they, no one went in yesterday? Today was the first day. 
Uh, yeah, that's what I'm at. Quick the, for those people, so did anyone go in yesterday on Monday? T today was the first day that we had did embassy any, officers. Anyone? Well, okay. That's and right. They returned at night. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yes. You uh, traveling on embassy. Is it a train? Uh, let me let me take a couple. Any uh, one more question on Ukraine? Ukraine. Uh, Simon, let's move it around. Yeah. Um, Secretary uh, has spoken, including uh, on the Hill today, about the, the war entering a, a different phase. Um, and obviously this is something that was discussed in the meeting with Zelensky with, with the other Ukrainian officials. Um, in terms of what new weapons are required by the Ukrainians for this new phase, uh, you know, you've spoken about howitzers, long-range artillery. Um, you know, are there any other uh, types of weaponry that they're particularly asking for and that you're, you're considering giving any more sophisticated systems than, than that? Well, I, I think it um, uh, would start by saying that we've already provided uh, sophisticated systems uh, directly or facilitated the provision of sophisticated uh, systems directly in response uh, to what our Ukrainian partners uh, have been asking for. And it is a regular staple of our engagement with our Ukrainian partners that they update us uh, on their particular needs. And those needs are different now than they were in the earliest days and hours uh, of the invasion, because as you alluded to, uh, Russia's aggression is shifting uh, from uh, its initial ambitions to take the capital city, uh, its initial ambitions to engage in successful urban warfare, uh, to now uh, the campaign for the South and the East. And so as uh, Russia's war aims have shifted after they've been uh, defeated uh, in their initial aspirations, uh, the nature of our assistance uh, has changed as well in terms of the capabilities and the systems that uh, we are uh, providing them. Uh, when Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken met with President Zelensky and his team in Kyiv on Sunday, there was a discussion uh, of, the, uh, of the battlefield and precisely what uh, implications that battlefield uh, holds for Ukrainian needs. You heard from Secretary Blinken in the aftermath of that, that we had, um, we're going to be in a position to provide hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, in FMF, foreign military financing. This is uh, separate and distinct uh, from the presidential drawdowns that you've heard us um, put forward in previous weeks, but it is equally uh, useful. And in many ways, it gives our Ukrainian partners flexibility in terms of uh, what it is that they are procuring from the United States uh, for their defensive needs against this uh, Russian aggression. Uh, Secretary Blinken also announced uh, more than uh, $150 million or so uh, in terms of ammunition, the Department of Defense has talked about uh, the artillery, the uh, systems that the Ukrainians have requested uh, for uh, the battle for uh, the Donbass, and I'll defer to the DOD to speak to that. question about the German tanks, sure. which is, you know, finally the, the Germans today uh, agreed to send their tanks. Well, now, according to Reuters, Switzerland is refusing to do the re-export of the ammo needed for those tanks. Is there... Anything the U.S. can do in Switzerland to try to clear this out, given how long Ukraine has been waiting for the German. Well, Germany has been an important partner, an important member of the coalition that we have put together, uh, not only in recent weeks, but over the course of, of recent months. And we welcome Germany's announcements uh, over the course of months that it will increase defense spending, bolster defense capability and readiness. Uh, its announcement that it had halted. Uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and uh, its transfer of lethal assistance and now heavy weaponry to Ukraine. Uh, these bold moves, we think, will strengthen Germany's role as a leader in global security, in line with its diplomatic, economic development, and humanitarian influence in Europe uh, and around the world. It's not for us to speak to specific systems or assets or capabilities that any other country is uh, providing, so I'll leave it to our German allies to speak to uh, what it is precisely uh, that they're providing. Uh, and I would have to refer you to the Swiss government for any uh, um, uh, discussions between those sure. two governments. Yes. Um, uh, Georgia participated in, in every peace mission and is a valuable NATO partner. Having this in mind, can Georgia get any tentative dates uh, regarding its aspirations to become a NATO EU member? We all have heard that it's a consensus-based decision, but don't you think the Georgia people and government uh, deserve to know how much longer? They need to wait instead of being told that uh, it will happen someday. And second question, please. You say you understand Georgia's uh, position very well, but it's fact that there are both uh, some opposition members inside 
of my country and uh, also in south of, of, of my country, who are trying to nudge Georgia toward a decidedly radical pos uh, position on this. And this is happening in parallel to the ongoing Russian invasion in Ukraine. In our partner uh, country, there uh, was even talk of opening up a second front in Russia. Uh, um, on Russia. And this is being advised to a country that uh, together with Moldova faces the greatest risk of re re renewed uh, Russian aggression. As you know, 20% of my country uh, is occupied of uh, occupied by Russia. What objectives do you think this campaign for more radical stance and increased pressure on the Georgian government serve? This has been, as I uh, said, uh, yeah, inside of my country and uh, outside of my uh, country, I mean uh, opposition members. And uh, this campaign is permitted with so much disinformation, the uh, so-called uh, secret recordings that are paraded as uh, scandalous or exclusive uh, while neither in the case. Thank you. So on your first question, uh, we have said for some 15 years now uh, that we support Georgia's NATO aspirations. Uh, we believe that uh, NATO's open door policy uh, it should be an open door uh, for those countries that aspire uh, to join the alliance. We've also said uh, that no outside entity uh, can or should have a veto on uh, any eligible country's aspirations uh, to join the NATO membership. Now, as you alluded to in your question, uh, the uh, membership process uh, it is a uh, process uh, that is overseen by uh, the alliance. These will be alliance decisions. There are a set of requirements that any aspirant country uh, will need to fulfill um, before being uh, eligible uh, to be considered for uh, full membership. But Georgia already is an important NATO partner. Uh, we have had uh, close consultations with Georgia uh, on the margins of NATO meetings. Uh, and to your second question, uh, and this bridges the two, uh, we have consistently uh, stood by Georgia and with the people of Georgia uh, and their desire to be a free and, and sovereign people in a free and sovereign country. And over the years, from the earliest days of uh, Georgia's post-Soviet independence, independence uh, we have now developed a uh, strategic partnership uh, between our countries. We work together towards our shared vision of a Georgia that is fully integrated into the Euro-Atlantic family of nations and part of a Europe that is whole, uh, free, and uh, we would hope at peace. Uh, and this is a vision that uh, takes hard work, it takes patience, uh, it takes significant resources to realize. Uh, that's why we have uh, sought to do our part. We have allocated almost $6 billion in assistance uh, funds to Georgia. We've trained over 20,000 Georgian soldiers. Uh, we've sent over 6,000 people to the United States for cultural and educational exchange programs. We've helped promote economic growth, the rule of law, democratic government governance, many other initiatives that are important to the Georgian people and their aspirations, but important interests of ours uh, as well. And so we'll continue to partner with Georgia uh, on their uh, aspirations, on their ambitions, uh, and to protect uh, what they've been able to achieve. Jenny, I'll go back to you. Thank you very much uh, on the North Korea. I have two questions also in North Korea. Uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un mentioned the preemptive use of their nuclear weapons at a military parade in Pyongyang yesterday regarding Kim Jong-un's emphasis on the use of nuclear powers rather than dialogue for abandoning the nuclear program. How can you assessing the prospect for future dialogue with North Korea and not a follow-up next location? Well, to start, uh, your reference to uh, Kim Jong-un's speech yesterday at the military parade. Uh, we're aware of uh, what he said. Uh, it reiterates our assessment that the DPRK constitutes a threat to international peace and security uh, and to the global nonproliferation regime. Uh, we have a vital interest together with our allies and partners around the world, but especially those in the Indo-Pacific, uh, to uh, deter uh, the DPRK, to defend against its provocations or uh, its use of force to limit the reach of its most dangerous weapons programs, and above all, to keep safe uh, American people in the region, our deployed forces, and our uh, allies, uh, Japan and the ROK uh, being two of them. Our, our goal remains the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, 
Uh, as you've heard me say before, and as recently as last week, we harbor no hostile intent uh, toward the DPRK. We do remain open to engaging in diplomacy and dialogue with the DPRK uh, with an aim of achieving progress uh, towards that overall objective. Uh, but we also have uh, an obligation to address the recent provocations that we've seen from the DPRK, including uh, its two recent uh, ICBM launches. We have an obligation to enforce uh, the UN Security Council resolutions that are in place. Those are obligations that we'll continue uh, to work on very closely uh, with our allies in the region, with our partners in the region, uh, and with our allies and partners at the UN. And it goes without saying, of course, that our commitment uh, to our treaty allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, is ironclad and remains that way. And second question, uh, according to a recent exchange of a personal letter between South Korean President Moon and uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, in this letter, North Korea contains three conditions for dialogue with South Korea. What is your assessment of the sincerity of uh, Kim Jong-un? It's not for me to assess the sincerity uh, of anything that has come from the DPRK. What we've said before uh, is that we support uh, inter-Korean dialogue. We support uh, anything that uh, de-escalates tensions and that moves us closer uh, towards our shared objective with the ROK, uh, and that's a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Joseph. Thanks. Um, Secretary Blinken was asked multiple times today about the uh, Vienna talks and uh, nuclear deal. He was, I mean, he used very intricate language multiple times when it came to the FTO designation um, and sp specifying the Quds Force. Um, can you give us any updates on where those are? Are there, you know, is there anything scheduled, any meeting scheduled back in Vienna? And is that what's holding up the deal the, uh, right now? Is it the FTO designation on the IRGC or the IRGC Quds Force? We don't have any travel uh, to Vienna to preview. Uh, we are in close contact with the EU coordinator, uh, who continues to convey messages uh, back and forth. Uh, we continue, as you heard me uh, say just the other day, uh, we remain um, hopeful that an agreement can be reached, uh, but it can be reached only if Iran is prepared to uh, conclude a deal uh, without, for example, raising issues that are extraneous to uh, the JCPOA, if that's the case. Uh, we believe that we can uh, achieve a mutual return to compliance of the JCPOA in fairly short order. And that <coughs> remains our goal for a couple of reasons. You heard the secretary speak to this uh, today. It remains our goal principally uh, because President Biden has a commitment to see to it that Iran is never in a position to acquire a nuclear weapon. And the fact is that while the JCPOA was in full effect from implementation day uh, in early 2016 until May of 2018, uh, Iran was verifiably and permanently prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and again, when the JCPOA was in full effect, uh, the breakout time, that is to say, uh, the time that Iran would require to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon if it chose uh, to go in that direction, uh, was about 12 months when the deal was consummated and, and fully in effect. Uh, now, and the secretary said this today, uh, that breakout time is measured not in months, but unfortunately in weeks. Uh, and that is something that is unacceptable to us. It's a long-term proposition. Uh, that is why we continue to see if we can reach a conclusion, uh, a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. But as we've said, we're preparing equally for uh, either world, a world in which we have a JCPOA and a world in which uh, we are uh, forced to uh, seek other means to um, be faithful to the president's commitment. Now, the challenge is uh, we've seen both of these worlds. Uh, we've seen what a world with a fully functioning uh, JCPOA looks like. And again, that's a world in which Iran is verifiably and permanently constrained from obtaining a nuclear weapon with a breakout time uh, that is extended. Uh, and we've seen a world without a JCPOA. Uh, so this is not a thought experiment. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a real world experiment uh, when it comes to uh, the utility of the JCPOA. And in the world uh, in which the JCPOA, JCPOA has been suspended, uh, not only have we seen Iran's nuclear program gallop forward with the installation of centrifuges, the 
uh, accumulation of nuclear material, uh, various developments that would contravene uh, the obligations under uh, the JCPOA. Uh, but we've seen Iran that has acted with even greater impunity. Uh, we've seen an Iran that has enabled its proxies, that has supported um, uh, malevolent uh, groups and actors uh, in the region. We've seen an Iran that has continued uh, with its ballistic missile program. We've seen an Iran uh, that has continued to be a deeply destabilizing force uh, to the region. Uh, we believe that if we are able to put Iran's nuclear program back into a box, if we are able to contain what would constitute uh, the greatest challenge we could face from Iran, the greatest challenge we could face in the region, uh, that we will be more effective and better positioned uh, to confront these other challenges uh, that we face with Iran. So there's some distance yet to close. It's unclear if we're going to be able to get there, um, but it remains our assessment that mutually returning to the JCPOA would profoundly be in our interest and we'll pursue that mutual return uh, as long as it remains in our interest. You, you mentioned yourself um, months ago that this wouldn't be open-ended. And uh, I mean, the talks have been going on for a little over a year. Granted, I mean, that, it's not it's not an easy agreement to reach, but um, I mean, surely, and you guys have also been saying that the breakout time is a matter of weeks for now months. Um, so I mean, how, how much longer are you guys willing to wait? Because it seems like, you know, Iran's, has its demands and they're not backing down. Well, we're, we're going to test the proposition of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA for as long as doing so remains in our interests. Uh, and the fact is that right now, Iran's breakout time, uh, it is far shorter than we would like. Uh, were we to re-enter the JCPOA and, and uh, more precisely, were Iran to once again be subject to the most stringent verification and monitoring regime uh, ever negotiating, negotiated, that breakout time would be extended. Uh, so as long as the non-proliferation benefits that a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, brings uh, is better than what we have now, that will likely be an outcome that's in our interest. But again, uh, we may not be able to get there uh, because a negotiation, uh, in this case, not only does it take two parties, but uh, there are multiple parties in this uh, and there are complex questions, some of which remain unresolved. Yeah, and on this, and I'll leave aside the argument that we could get into over whether everyone agrees that the JCPOA permanently and verifiably that ended your nuclear potential, Iran's nuclear potential, leaving, leaving, leaving that aside. The Secretary seemed to suggest in his answers today that the State Department and the DNI had made a determination that the threat against former Secretary Pompeo and Special Envoy Cook from Iran continued and that you are continuing to pay uh, whatever amount it is uh, per month for protection for that. Uh, did, is that correct? Is that a correct reading of what he said? There is only so much I can say on this, but we have an obligation uh, that we take very seriously. Uh, to provide protection to former officials uh, of this building who may be subject to a threat. Now, I think you could understand why. Uh, if someone were, in fact, subject to a foreign threat, we probably wouldn't want to speak to that publicly so as not to uh, spotlight uh, something like that, to spotlight uh, measures we might be taking uh, to mitigate any such threat. Uh, but you heard this from the National Security Advisor on January 9th, I think it was, of this year. Uh, he issued a very clear statement. Yes, but after after that, and I remember that, and I appreciate the fact that he said that, but after that, you guys notified the Hill that you were spending $2 million a month, roughly, to, for protection for these two former officials, and also that a decision had to be made within the next, within 10 days of that notification, uh, whether or not you were going to ask for more money to continue that protection. And it sounded to me, from, from what the Secretary said, that you had made that decision. We notify the Hill of many things that we're not in a position to speak about publicly. Uh, let me move around. Just Yes, please. Quick follow-up on Iran. Quick follow-up on Iran. Okay. Follow-up on Iran. The Israelis, the Times of Israel, reported that the Iranians were actually trying to stop Iran from entering the Middle East. And the Americans have basically acknowledged the failure of the Vienna talks, and you're about to make that public in a very short order. Can you comment on that? 
my comment would be precise to the answer that I offered uh, to Joseph just a moment ago, uh, that we are going to pursue a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA as long as it remains in our national interest to do so. So the Israelis in this case are wrong, exaggerating? That uh, it sounds like you're citing a press report that's citing anonymous Israelis. So uh, oftentimes that is a recipe for information that may not be entirely accurate. Wrong yes. question. To okay. Sorry, um, I just want to build off what Joseph was asking you. Um, can you just explain to us how the breakout time has remained weeks for months now? It seems to indicate that Iran has slowed down accelerating its program, uh, has you know uh, done it more slowly than you expected it to. Is that the case? Can you just explain how we're in the same place we were in January, February? Well, the breakout time is an assessment. It's an assessment based on uh, our technical uh, know-how. It's an assessment, assessment uh, that is based on um, uh, non-public sources of information as well. So there's only so much uh, we can say on this. Uh, but I don't think it's fair uh, to say that uh, the Iranians are uh, or feel uh, constrained uh, right now in terms of their nuclear program. Uh, and that's precisely why we are still testing the proposition of a potential mutual return to compliance so that they are constrained uh, by the JCPOA, the constraints that are conveyed by the JCPOA in terms of centrifuges, in terms of amassing uh, nuclear material, in terms of amassing heavy water, uh, in terms of uh, what all of that means for a potential uh, breakout time. Uh, yes. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I have a quick question about China. Uh, the Secretary Blinken uh, mentioned today, uh, he will speak publicly about comprehensive strategy to deal with China. So the United States has published uh, interim national security strategy and in Pacific strategy already, uh, which are focusing on China uh, in some ways. So, could you tell us, understand, uh, could you help us understand what the difference between the uh, incoming strategy and the on ongoing strategies? So, the Secretary did mention that he expected to have an opportunity in the coming days, coming weeks, uh, to speak in a, in a bit more depth uh, to our approach to the PRC. I think what you're referring to when you mention our Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, this was a strategy that Secretary Blinken laid out uh, on a fairly fairly memorable trip uh, for those of you who were with us uh, in Jakarta uh, late last year, in December of, of last year. And our Indo-Pacific strategy, as the name suggests, uh, is focused on the broader region, uh, is focused on uh, principally our partnership with uh, the region and our uh, shared vi vision uh, with and for the region. It's a vision of uh, a region that is uh, centered on key elements. Uh, first, advancing a, a free and open Indo-Pacific in which problems are dealt with openly. Uh, rules will be reached transparently and, and applied fairly. Goods and ideas, people will flow freely. Uh, second, it's about forging stronger connections uh, within and beyond the region uh, on a bilateral basis or uh, on a multilateral basis, if you talk about uh, the Quad, uh, or stitching together uh, our partnerships and alliances, uh, if you were to talk about, for, for example, an AUKUS. Um, third, it's a vision that promotes broad base prosperity uh, for the region, again, uh, with us uh, as a partner, knowing that uh, the region is home to some 40% of global GDP. It's a region of opportunity, uh, not only for uh, the people of the region, but also uh, for the United States. It's a vision that seeks to build a more resilient Indo-Pacific, uh, resilience against COVID, resilience against climate change, uh, resilience against uh, shared threats. And, and finally, uh, it's a region in which we seek to bolster security. And there are any number uh, of threats uh, and when it comes to our assessment, uh, our system of alliances and partnerships uh, is the most important tool we have uh, when it comes to confronting those threats. So it's a vision principally for a broader region. We've talked about uh, our approach to the PRC. Uh, we've talked about the multifaceted relationship uh, we have with the PRC, but I know that the secretary looks forward in, in the coming days uh, to speaking a bit more about that. Uh, Matt, uh, yes, on, yep. on Palestinian radiation. Uh, Ned, it's been six months since uh, six organizations were designated as terrorist organizations. I know I've asked you this question many times before, so please indulge me. You know, so and I know that you requested clarification from the Israelis, and you received that clarification. Are you satisfied that these organizations, these six organizations, 
are in fact engaged in terrorist activities. You know, because their funding has been cut off, the European Union is looking at maybe there's been experts today, UN experts that said they should be funded. There's been no evidence that they have engaged in terrorist activities. What is your uh, assessment? After As I've said for some time now, Saeed, our Israeli partners have provided us with information regarding the basis for uh, their determination. That's information that we're reviewing. It's a process that can be lengthy because it's a process that takes place not only here, not only here in this building, but uh, also uh, across other departments and agencies uh, across town. I can say more broadly uh, that we've made it very clear to our Israeli government and Palestinian, Palestinian Authority uh, interlocutors. Uh, that independent civil society organizations in the West Bank and in Israel uh, must be able to continue their important work. Uh, we value the monitoring of human rights violations and abuses that independent NGOs undertake in Gaza, undertake in the West Bank, undertake uh, in Israel and, and elsewhere. And we strongly believe that respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and a strong civil society are critically important to responsive and to responsive uh, democratic governance. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, we have already designated, we long ago designated the PFLP as, a, as an FTO. Uh, they have been designated as an FTO since 1997. Uh, and we've not designated, as you know, any of the six NGOs uh, that the Israeli uh, government did. Uh, it's also important to note we haven't funded these groups. But the PFLP is one thing, and this organization is another thing altogether. And I understand that you have designated the PFLP a long time ago as a terrorist organization. And there's maybe a good reason for that, I don't know. But on these six organizations, they have conducted themselves only in, in terms of human rights abuses, reporting on that, you know, doing civil uh, society organizations and so on. That's something we're looking at. Uh, Ned, Ned. Uh, Israel, you presume that you've seen these uh, very lengthy um, regulations that were dated February, but apparently take effect uh, in May. For entry, for entry by foreigners into the West Bank? I'm not immediately familiar with them, but if we have a reaction, we'll let you know. Uh, yeah, because it would require foreigners of any, <clears throat> any nationality to get prior approval from Israeli military officials at the embassy to where they're applying for uh, a visa before they can even present themselves for entry into the West Bank. So, yes, I'd be very interested in any uh, reaction you have, and also if this will have any impact on the visa waiver um, negotiations, uh, because as you know, one of the main sticking points in that has been the treatment of Palestinian Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon. I just wanted to <clears throat> try and clarify something. You, you, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that you were mentioning, I think uh, the, the exchange that, that took place in, in, in on the Hill earlier, the Secretary was being asked about a formal national security strategy on China. Uh, in your response just now, um, you seem to suggest he will address this issue in coming weeks, but there isn't a separate strategy for China that's, that's forthcoming. Can you just clarify? Uh, he's going to address something in, in coming weeks, but it's not going to be a... a well, the, 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 the question was how remarks on the PRC might be different from the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that, we, uh, that the Secretary uh, uh, explained in December of last year. And so my uh, answer was the fact that uh, that was a regional uh, strategy. It wasn't It wasn't uh, uh, about any one country. It was about our uh, partnership with the region and our bilateral relationships uh, with the countries of the region and the uh, uh, relationships we have uh, bilaterally and multilaterally uh, with blocks in the region as well. So the Secretary will detail a specific strategy for China? The, the secretary looks forward to speaking more about our approach to the PRC in the coming days. Uh, question, oh, final question? Yes. yes. Actually, two questions on Ukraine. First, to uh, clarify on what you just said in your response to the Colonel's question on embassy. Um, you mentioned traveling. Are the diplomats going back and forth? Is it like day long trip? Do you have any timeline on when the embassy in Kiev will be restaffed? And my second question after this. They are, they are making, uh, for the time being, day trips uh, into Lviv, that first day trip started today. As I said before, we are accelerating planning to uh, reestablish a diplomatic presence in our at our embassy in Kyiv. It is something we want to do uh, as soon as it is uh, responsible for us to do so. Awesome. And second question on uh, the last weekend's meeting. There are reports that uh, Zelensky handed over a uh, uh, plan to strengthen sanctions. 
uh, it's about wrapping up cycles against wrapped up um, and enablers. Uh, any, uh, are you in a position to uh, confirm those reports? Well, I think there are reports because in the Ukrainian government readout, it said that President Zelensky handed over uh, a document uh, regarding uh, the uh, Yermak McFall International Expert Group on strengthening sanctions. Uh, so sanctions enforcement, the next step uh, in our sanctions uh, against Russia and uh, those who are enabling uh, the Kremlin's war against Ukraine, that certainly was uh, a topic of uh, discussion and uh, we'll continue to coordinate closely with our Ukrainian partners on that. Thank you.